Welcome to the Occitan Center. When we talk about new economic thinking, maybe we need a Frank Geary in our midst. I uh, noted at the outset, John Kennedy talked about the failure of a previous paradigm and the desire to come to Berlin. And he was uh, almost 30 years early in his uh, prediction of the failure of that paradigm. And uh, so that gives us a little time to work on things. I'm very, very happy to be in Berlin this year. My board and I uh, thought about many different possible locations, but the excitement of being here at a time where there is so much of the architecture in play, when there are so many possibilities for people to start anew. And I know in particular, because I've read a lot of the press here uh, in, the, in the previous year, really, that a lot of people see a wide difference between what you might call the model of financial economics that originates in the United States and the UK and the way in which the German people would like to see an economy and a society organized. I uh, really believe that INET was formed out of discomfort with that financial system that the Germans and many Europeans express uh, concern about. And I, so I think that being here at this time is, how do you say, the, the essence of INET. Erasmus once said that true friendship is opposition. And I believe uh, Carlo Yeager, who is somewhere here, at a dinner a couple of nights ago said, I really, really disagree with one of my best friends, and we fight continuously. But I know we are partners. We are partners in the search for understanding. And it's in that spirit that the liveliness of the debate, first of all, should be centered in Berlin because of the importance of Germany. And as we seek to enlarge our community, I feel very, very grateful that we could do this conference here with the inspiration and support of the Mercator Foundation and our traditional partners at CG. There's one other development that's what I would call a, uh, a real, how you say, source of inspiration to me. About an hour ago, I walked over in the Adlan Hotel and in the last three weeks, they organized a youthful group we call the Young Scholars Initiative Commons. And they're up over my shoulder right now. They have over 300 people registered. Many of our speakers will get a chance to go and visit with them. And the music that you heard me start the conference with, and I never do these things randomly, was the song from a very young group called Arcade Fire, called appropriately, We're Ready to Start. And the lyrics are that all the kids have always known that the emperor wears no clothes, but they bow down to them anyway because it's better than being alone. I think that INET's purpose is to form a community so that those young people who we will pass the baton to, who someday will inhabit this room when my daughter, who was born on the 20th of March, is in that room. I want those people to feel a community. I want those people to have the courage to follow their creativity at this time when it is so evident that many of our practices in economics, many of our procedures have, have been found wanting. I think uh, there's an there's a old adage, I think it was first in The Little Prince by Antoine Saint-Exupéry, 
where he said that it's, uh, it's, it's a secret that is only with the heart that one can rightly see. What is essential is invisible to the eyes, and it is only a young person's eyes that can see with the heart. Well, we are in the business of integrating head and heart, and as I struggle with the idea, which, by the way, I didn't found, that we are the Institute for New Economic Thinking, I'm often asked, what do you mean by new economic thinking? And the best answer I can come up with, it's not that new is novel, that new is something that is different from that which didn't work, obviously didn't work in the previous period. Mark Toma, who I believe is here, teased us last year by saying, I figured out at Bretton Woods what IDET was about. It's about reading old books, and that's new economic thinking. Well, I, I had a good chuckle this morning because the finance minister of Germany, Wolfgang Schabler, said in his statement, which is in your program, However, I would also like to point out that it is not just new thinking we need. Rather, it is often equally important to recall older ideas and approaches that may have fallen out of the limelight in the meantime. So uh, Wolfgang Schauble is a candidate for new economic thinker, and I'm grateful for the, uh, the blessings that he gave us. Maybe we should change the name to the Institute for Sound Economic Thinking, but I think we have work to do before we can call it that. In the first couple of years of INET, we've given out over $13 million in grants to about 100 grantees from over 18 countries. We have an advisory board of about 42 people, and uh, as you know, this is our third annual conference. We've struck out very hard and uh, made a big push to increase the viability and reintroduction of the history of economic thought and economic history into the curriculum, and through the leadership of Perry Merling and Robert Skidelsky, we conducted a diagnostic phase on the nature of current curriculums and ideas for reform, and I know that Wendy Carlin from our advisory board is looking forward, uh, particularly through the INET at Oxford program, of uh, building that in the next uh, dimension with the help of our advisory board. At this stage, what INET's really working on is a what you might call a broadening of a network. We want to be able to reach all corners of the planet. We want to be nourished by all corners of the planet. Uh, various announcements that we uh, brought forward today at the press conference, including the very substantial second stage and build out of the INET at Oxford that will be led by Eric Beinhacker, who's seated to my left, and uh, in the context of the Martin, James Martin 21st Century School that Ian Golden is the director of. We're on the cusp of opening INET at Cambridge in the fall. Uh, we have a new initiative in Copenhagen on imperfect knowledge economics, uh, which Roman Friedman, Katrina Jusilius, and others will be uh, leading. They always talk about it as Ike, I-K-E. And this makes me feel good, because those of you who know me know that I was responsible for the resurrection of the career in music of Ike Turner. So I'm just back working with Ike. <laughs> any rate, uh, we're also pursuing a summer and a winter school in India that Arjun Jayadev has uh, worked very hard to help us cultivate in Bangalore. And uh, we're on the cusp of developing something in Hong Kong, hopefully in the uh, partnership, <coughs> excuse me, in the partnership with uh, Andrew Sheng's uh, Fung Institute, though that's uh, just beginning. And, and there's also possibilities in Chile, in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, and hopefully, as I say, we keep working within a year or so, INET will, will have outposts across the planet. I uh, have been in the process of working with the board and working with the advisory board, become convinced that economists, I'm a, I'm a sailor, so I'll use my metaphor, economists have been making bad maps. 
and the ship has hit the rocks. And so I've tried to examine what we might call the siren songs of temptation, to use Odysseus as my model, and look at the kinds of influences that have taken economics off course and to therefore understand what, uh, what we can do that is corrective. I think there are really three areas that I'll touch on, uh, two of them briefly. One of them is the attraction to power and influence. Reinhold Niebuhr, the theologian, once said that the physical sciences gained their freedom when they overcame traditionalism based on ignorance. But the traditionalism which social science face is based upon the economic interest of the dominant social class trying to maintain their special privilege in society. H.L. Mencken, in his article, The Dismal Scientist, said, and I remind you who Niebuhr was, the only people I trust less than theologians are economists. And that's because they're not free. They can see the contours of power in society and they don't necessarily have the freedom to argue both sides of the logic of an argument equally freely. I think the uh, anthropologists often talk about discovering where power and ideas are in a society through the blind spots and the taboos. Those things which are not said are often more revealing than those things which are said. And INET has looked at the questions of why we don't embrace, as George Soros talked about earlier, a very vivid and textured understanding of political economy. Or why, like in the work of Thomas Ferguson, we don't look at the role of money in politics. And illuminating these questions that relate to governance, relate to collective action, and relate to the incentives that society faces is a blind spot. And to some degree, as economists, we look at ourselves and we never seem to apply price theory and incentives to ourselves. We model ourselves as benevolent Martians who look down and turn the dial on the venal earthlings, but we don't endogenize ourselves in those models and understand those refractory influences. I think a good old application of price theory to the incentives of economists would be called for in, in, in our next stage. But the area that I think is most dangerous is actually something different. It involves an earnestness. It involves good intentions like a doctor has when they try to tell you that you're going to be okay. And that is the response to the yearning for order and certainty. Recently, philosophers like Richard Rorty and Stephen Toulman have talked about this at great length. Uh, John Dewey once gave lectures, I think it was about 1929, on the quest for certainty and the problems that it uh, creates. The idea of false certainty is something that people find extremely attractive as long as they don't realize that it's false. But to refrain from the promise of certainty is very, very unsatisfying. At times, I think about the Thirty Years' War, which obviously ravaged the area we, uh, in this country and, and areas around it. Prior to that time, we had humanists like Bacon and Shakespeare and Montaigne as the leading voices. And afterwards, we moved to the era of Descartes and Newton. Stephen Toulmin's book, Cosmopolis, talks about how the unsettling emotional context in which Enlightenment thinking was developed was one that demanded being devoid of context, pursuing what you might call antiseptic or sanitized thinking. I'm often amused when I read Keynes' famous quote, how practical men who believe themselves exempt from intellectual influences are the slave of a defunct economist. 
Madmen in authority who hear the voices in the air distilling their frenzy from an academic scribbler of a few years back. Well, the question I would raise is what got into the head of the academic scribbler? And I think at some level, the academic scribblers are the victim of the tribal customs that emerged from the emotional traumas of the Thirty Years' War. Ironically, exactly at the time when you can feel that there is no order is the time when people yearn for order. They, they demand it when it's most anxious because it's not apparent to them. And experts can fill this void in a rather, what you might call, false reassurance. Peter Drucker wrote about this in his very first book, which was started in 1935 and published eventually in 1939, called The End of Economic Man. And I think in recent years, for a variety of reasons that are probably a melding of corruption and a melding of the uh, anxieties and the yearning for order, we've accepted very, very bad models of our financial process. I must say myself, I was educated at MIT and the first economics teacher I had, I was an aspiring naval architect. And the person who I walked in and introduced me and inspired me to become an economist was Charles Kindleberg. And he was giving a course in preparation for his book, Manias, Panics, and Crashes. So for me to see equilibrium financial theory, where essentially economists create certainty or a certainty equivalent. In other words, they pin down the future. And by presupposition, by assumption, it makes the past, excuse me, it makes the present stable. I, I, th I thought that was madness. But I didn't understand that this was not just some kind of hermetically sealed tribal custom of economists, though it can become that, and fascination with mathematics, mathematics as a language and tractability to express yourself can become a, what you might call another refractory influence. But what I, what I didn't perceive was that sometimes people need myths. There's a famous music writer named Robert Pattison and he wrote a passage which I'll quote. Illusions aren't errors that be, oh, excuse me. Whether a myth is objectively true is of no importance to its believers. A myth is tested against the emotional needs of the living, not the objective events of the past. John Gray, the controversial philosopher in London, also says, illusions aren't errors that can be corrected by an increase in the intellectual ability or understanding. Illusions are beliefs we have because we need to have them in some way. I, I believe at some level the next task is to develop a paradigm which acknowledges what George and following Colin Popper called fallibility, which does not succumb to the idea that you can be popular by creating false resolution or false certainty in uncertain times. I know Roman Friedman and Michael Goldberg and Katrina Jusilius and others embarking on imperfect knowledge of economics. Some of the recent work by Sheila Dow, Ned Phelps and others is on this path. And I do see if there is a new paradigm, it's not likely as Schauble said in his note to us, it's not likely to be a paradigm which involves kind of a unique path or certainty. I think as the philosophers like Rorty and Toulmin have brought forward, we are going to have to re-examine in the absence of certainty why institutions arise, what kind of texture and context and situations matter, and that this yearning for universal truths is is perhaps, uh, if not a distraction, at least it's gone beyond the point of uh, diminishing marginal utility. One of the big problems of this question related to certainty, or the absence thereof, is I, uh, how you say, people on the right in America demonize the government, so we might borrow from the Rolling Stones and talk about this as sympathy for the devil. 
the idea that nations are well defined in an era of international capital flows, large complex financial institutions that sometimes operate in 120 countries, multinational supply chains are taking place all around the world. And then you trot out somebody like Secretary Geithner, and he's supposed to act like he's in control of the situation. When I talked about scholars providing a sense of false certainty and reassurance, there may be a temptation for them to do that. But a leading policymaker is actually asked to be in control of a situation that he cannot possibly control. And the kind of rituals that that gives rise to are an extraordinary kind of dance. And what do you do? As my board member, Andy Haldane of the Bank of England once said to me, what do you do when you know you're not in control? Do you walk out on stage and say, we can't control this, this is chaotic? Or do you try to do things that maintain a semblance of order by what you might call overstating the power or the controls that you do have? I think all these questions sit before us, but it's really through adopting the notion that certainty is not available. We talked about this group, this young group behind us that they are calling, uh, they have a beautiful logo and everything, they call it Occupy INET. And I look back recently at the man who coined the term Occupy Wall Street. His name is Kelly Lawson. He runs a magazine called Adbusters. And he was asked to comment about idealistic document called the Port Huron Statement that was written in the early 60s in the United States. And what he said was, if you ask me, what's most powerful, personal, and, and collective feeling of the Occupy movement is the feeling of gloom and doom because they think they're looking toward a black hole future. They cannot see any order. I don't know why this Port Huron statement is important. I'm not quite sure we need a manifesto to say that we're fear we're heading towards a black hole. Now, that kind of notion, that, that sense of anxiety, is something that these blind spots reinforce. The idea that the world now looks through the eyes of the press and identifies that inequality is suddenly present when anybody at the Economic Policy Institute in the United States could have seen for 40 years that inequality has been increasing with very rapid velocity since about 1978. Avoidance of environmental change when it means a frightening change to your personal livelihood is another area where we we continue with blind spots. And as I mentioned, the debate over the provision of public goods and collective action. Adam Smith wrote about how markets don't pro provide to any of us an adequate provision of public goods. When I listen to the Hayekian scholars, I often hear these statements that perhaps there's a justified cynicism, but the idea that Government just can't work, so you might as well eliminate it. That seems to me to be confining us as a society to fly on a much lower trajectory than is possible and has been proven successfully in many places. So at INET, we have a number of research programs which we're about to initiate on financial system architecture and what Axel Leyenhofer or Sheila Dow call open systems, where the future isn't pinned down and it isn't certain on questions of environmental economics, on questions of the economics of innovation, which itself is a disruptive change and takes apart what, are what you might call the illusions of stable parameters of economic structure. Collective action in governance and a number of other smaller themes that will develop over time. Questions of development, questions of institutional importance. These are the kind of, how we say, thrusts that we will develop. And in addition, as I mentioned, 
Wendy Carlin and the advisory board are going to lead a renewed and enthusiastic curriculum development program. Most of you have now read or known that uh, at Harvard, as a reaction to the Occupy movement, there was a, a disruption about their fundamental economics course. And I hope that INET can become a repository for alternative views of how to organize your economics course or other textbooks. I know Janos Varoufakis is here uh, there and has a very interesting textbook with Joseph Halevi and another author. Uh, Wendy Carlin has an interesting heterodox textbook which I think is being revised. I think we have some affirmative examples in our midst. I think there are all kinds of reading lists and other things and videos. Bob Schiller's lectures on finance are very important. Bob Schiller wrote one of the papers that most influenced me in my life, a 1981 paper in the American Economic Review where he said, if you follow the dividend discount model of a stock price, you can't explain more than about 18% of what's going on. I mean, it's, it's okay if your model only explains about 75%, but when you're at 18%, you don't really want to stand up and brag about it very much. So I think there's an awful lot for INET to do. There's an awful lot that can be brought forward. As Danny Goroff from the Sloden Foundation said to me, INET is ultimately in the business of providing public goods, providing history of economic thought videos because people won't hire faculty members to teach the history of economic thought. So I know that uh, on the question of curriculum reform, we're in an early stage and people like Wendy are far more sophisticated than I am. But I do say myself that Economics 101 should not be a hazing ritual to indoctrinate in the, the ambitious in an alienated topic where they prove their suitability for elite membership, but rather should be more closely modeled on a philosophy of science course, something like Phil Morawski might want to teach, where you can see the strengths and the weaknesses. You can see the shortcomings and the trade-offs in model building and in different visions of society. And you can also, through the history of thought, see the context in which these decisions were made. You can see the context and the institutions and the vested interests that surround all of us. Finally, I was once asked in giving a speech at the Southern Economic Association when I thought INET would have succeeded. And uh, many of you probably saw, I have a group of performance artists who are on stage who are going to be with us building artistic representation in the auditorium right behind us and you can all visit. But my view is that economics will only be back on course and stay on course when it's thoroughly reintegrated with the humanities. And the reason I believe that is that when you are integrated with the humanities and you are sensitive and attentive to the needs of people, you can't get as far off course as we have in recent years. Uh, when <coughs> excuse me. when uh, Muhammad Ali spoke at the Harvard graduation, he finished his speech and he got off the stage. And somebody yelled out to him, wait a minute, Ali, where's the poem? And it is now in the Guinness Book of World Records that the shortest poem in history was rendered by Muhammad Ali at that moment. And the poem goes like this. Me, we. And I think that the challenge for economics at this juncture, when the notion that you are Horatio Alger and if you put your head down and you work hard, you can control your own fate, was destroyed in 2008 when hardworking, well-educated, well-meaning people all over the world lost their homes, lost a tremendous amount of their society and things that mattered to them. And we're still struggling with that. I think 
the idea of the Horatio Alger myth was another one of those false resolutions of uncertainty. And to know in our modeling that people matter to each other, to reinvestigate through psychology how people matter to each other, and I note that Dennis Snower and I met yesterday on some very sophisticated work he wants to embark upon in the realm of psychology and its relationship to economics. I think our, compuse, our, excuse me, our consumer theories are just too, na too naive. I think, as Ali said, there is me and there is we. And we have to rebalance in economics to understand systems, understand institutions, understand the social texture, and as I said, become reintegrated with the humanities and with the purpose of being human. Thank you.